Let me tell you what's happening right now. The stage manager is getting upset because I'm moving the furniture. So I'd like to start by you assuming that you're in charge, that actually you're in charge of the world. Because in a little while, I'm going to ask you to make some decisions. And what I'm going to ask you to decide about is progress. Because I think we're in a state in the world now where we're running out of resources. Thank you. Uh, there's a lot of gadgets. We're running out of resources, and we have to decide what direction we're going to want to go, that we're going to go in. And so when I talk about progress, I like to take it back to first principles. What actually is progress? And to answer that question, I think we have to answer this question. How do we want to spend our lives? I mean, we never really think about that, but we should. What, what are we doing here? I mean, what are we doing here? But I really mean, what are we doing here? Because going f forward from here in this limited resource planet that we have, and also, if you accept that your life itself is a, a limited resource, going forward from here, it seems to me that the definition of progress should be that it facilitates whatever it is we are actually here for. So, 2009 had cooler cell phones than 2008. And this year, 2010, we have cooler cell phones than 2009. And of course, in 2011, we can predict that we are probably going to have cooler cell phones than 2010. In other words, year in, year out, we get cooler cell phones. But if it's the same year in and year out, can we really call it progress? Or is it just more of the same? Let me take a step back. In 2006, I was really worried about global warming. And I'm a writer, and I wanted to find a way to bring attention to global warming, popular attention. I didn't, I didn't want just the policy wonks to be thinking about it, the inside the Beltway crowd. How could I make it more popular? And so I came up with this idea that me and my family in the middle of Manhattan would attempt to live as environmentally as possible. And when I say this, I don't mean that we would change our light bulbs and carry cloth bags. What I mean is that we would go the whole hog. We would um, not use any sort of carbon producing transportation and so never get in a car, never even in mass transit. We would just um, get around by bike or by foot. And that eventually, because we couldn't buy sustainably produced electricity, we would actually turn the electricity off. Um, and so we went all the way. And I want to tell you, if, if you like, what we did was we retreated from progress. We withdrew from progress. I just want to tell you a couple of little stories about that. Uh, one was ab about a month, a month into the project. My little girl, Isabella, was 18 months old. And of course, I couldn't continue to use throwaway diapers because we couldn't make trash. And so this box arrived. And I don't know, when, if you have a little kid, you know that whenever a box arrives, I mean, when the bill from the tax collector comes, my little girl gets excited. She wants to open it. What is it, Dad? Can I have it? And so this box arrives, and she opens it up, and inside is this box of um, organic cloth cotton diapers, which she starts waving around. It's like the no-impact flag, right? She's waving it around. And she runs up to her mom, and she says, Mommy, Mommy, look, Bella's new diapers. And her mom, who's kind of on the couch reading a magazine, looks at her, and she says, Yes, honey, that's something you're going to be playing with with your daddy. <laughs> and in that moment, I went from... 50% diaper to 100% diaper changer. And um, it took a little while. And yes, there were some puddles on the floor because cloth diapers are a little bit like doing origami um, with consequences if you do it wrong. <laughs> but after about two weeks, um, I went to the closet to grab one of these diapers, and um, I couldn't find one. But I did find one plastic diaper in the back. And I thought, what the hell? It's there. It's no big deal. I'll just use it this one time. So I went to Isabella with this plastic diaper. And she started screaming at me, no, Bella want, Bella want new diapers, no. And you know, whatever. We had a little race around the apartment. And I eventually had to grab her and pin her. 
And I started to put this diaper on and she became hysterical. Like she did not want this diaper on her. So I had to find the cloth diaper and put it on. Now, we can do a little thought experiment here. Um, let's just assume that most of you are wearing cotton underwear. Um, we, we don't need to do a poll or anything, but... Um, now imagine that instead of this morning, instead of putting on cotton underwear, you take saran wrap and wear it around all day. And if you put yourself in that position, you understand why Isabella was objecting. And my wife, Michelle, saw this, and she said, you know, I don't know if having plastic against my baby's skin 24 hours a day, seven days a week for two years is poison for her and hurts her, but I do know that organic cotton does not harm her. And happily for me, at that moment, I went back from 100% diaper changer to 50% diaper changer <laughs> because she joined in. So another story, we, 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 eventually we had no electricity, which sounds like hardship, but without electricity it meant we had no TV, no air conditioner, we also had no takeout food. So on a hot summer's night, there was no point in our staying in the apartment, and we would go to Washington Square Park, and Isabella would play in the fountain, and, um, and Michelle and I would talk to our neighbors or listen to the students playing chamber music. Um, in other words, we... Instead of being isolated by our air conditioner, without the air conditioner, we were joining in with our community. And an old lady that I talked to from New York said that after, in the, she grew up in the years after World War II, and she told me that the hot nights in New York when she was growing up were the happiest nights of the year for her because um, at midnight, it would be too hot to be in the apartment, and everybody would pour out onto the street, and it would be like a street party in the middle of the night, and so much fun. So. I'm not saying that we should all not have electricity. What I am saying is that we have to be really careful when we think about this word progress. Because where are we contributing to human quality of life and where are we not? I mean, other things that happened in our project, for example, is we, we only ate local food. So industrialized food is supposed to be the big progress, but the result for us of only eating local food for the farmer's market was that we got healthy because you can trust the farmers, the local farmers, to make food that's good for you. Or because we got went around by our bikes instead of being transported in boxes, we got exercise as part of our daily routine instead of taking the taxi to the gym so that we could then run in place. <laughs> So what I realized during this project is it's not, the question really is not just about how do we use fewer resources. The question becomes when we use resources, how do we ensure that we're using them to make ourselves happy and the people around us happy? And generally, in the big companies, the big, the sustainability officers in those companies, what they're asking is can we do this forever and ever? Like, whatever it is, can I put solar panels on the roof of my factory? Can I put windmills up? Can I figure out how to just do it over and over and over again? And, you know, one of the big um, holy grails of the sustainability movement is the electric car. You know, we'll get the electric car, eventually we'll have windmills and we'll have solar panels and we'll plug the electric car into the windmills and solar panels and everything will be great and we can do it forever and ever. The only thing is we're still going to have this. And what is this? I'll tell you, the average LA citizen spends two weeks a year in a traffic jam, more than most Americans get for holiday. That the average American citizen spends 15% of their income on running their car, which just sounds like a number until you realize that 15% of income corresponds to seven weeks of your work year. So another holy grail of the sustainability movement is the compostability of food packaging. So we have the great news now that PepsiCo has come up with a compostable container for sun chips. Hip, hip, hooray. <laughs> if you're the parent of this child, you should be consoled by the fact that the paper, that the, that the potato chip container will be compostable. Or what I consider the biggest oxymoron in the sustainability movement, organic tobacco. We can now console ourselves by the fact that we can kill ourselves without killing the planet. 
And so what I think is that if this is sustainability, to hell with it. Because if it's not making our lives better, what's the point? The existential questions now are the practical questions. How do we want to spend this life? What are we here for? Are we here for sitting in traffic jams while consoling ourselves that there's no emissions coming out of our tailpipes? Or are we here to continue our obesity epidemic while consoling ourselves that the plastic bags are not going to stay in the ground forever and ever? Because if the resources are limited, and they are, shouldn't we be figuring out how to use them to make our lives better instead of just continuing to do what we're doing? Shouldn't the real question be not, can we do it forever and ever, but should we do it forever and ever? You know, one of the things that worried me when I did the No Impact Man project and the fact that we were melting the world was the way of life that we were melting the planet for. And it turns out that 27% of Americans suffer from anxiety and depression. We're not having a party. We should be having a party. And so when I say to hell with sustainability, you know, if you look up sustainability, sustain in the dictionary, it says to bear the weight of. Do we really want to bear the weight of our way of life? Or couldn't we aspire to be more? Instead of sustainability about being less and depriving ourselves, what about if we figure out how to help both ourselves and the planet? So I'll take, a, I'll take another step back. I have a small nonprofit. It's called the No Impact Project. And the mission of the, non of the nonprofit is to help people to discover ways of life that are both better for them and their planet. And when we design the web page, um, if, even if I say so for my, myself, one of the things that I think is so interesting is it doesn't say how do you want to save the planet or how do you want to deprive yourself. It says what do you want? Like what life do you want? And we've had 13,000 people now do this no impact week where they basically retreat from consumerdom for a week and experiment with living no impact for themselves. And what these people are saying at the end of the week is that they're not saying um, that they want compostable sun chips bags. What they're saying is they want things that are good for them. You know, here in the United States, so many kids don't even have access to an apple. They do have access to sun chips, but they don't have access to apples. So what I'm saying here is we shouldn't be making sun chip bags compostable. We should just be getting apples to the kids because the apples are already compostable. Or how we, thank you. Or how we use our land. Should we be inventing the electric car? Or should we find a way to use our land that's actually good for people? Where people can walk to the post office. Where people can come together and join together and be together. And where we make mass. Some people say, oh, you're just, you just want to, you, envir you environmentalists just want to take our cars away. No. I want land use and mass transit that's so good that you'd rather leave your car in the driveway. So... Um, sometimes, if you're, if you're a business person, you might be thinking, well, what does this have to do with me? Well, let's take for a minute the fact that Coke, over the last year, Coca-Cola, has built the largest recycling plant in the United States. And why did they do this? Because it should be good for business, right? What this does is it compares farmer's market sales with soft drink sales. And soft drink sales are going in the toilet. <laughs> and why? Because people sense that they want what's good for them, what's good for the planet, and what's good for them. So if you're in business, and you care about sustainability, and you want to use sustainability to profit your business, then what you need to do is remember that a surfer cannot ride the back of the wave. Recycling is the back of the way. And I would argue that the front of the wave is all about bringing what's good for the people to the people. It's good for the people and it's good for the planet. This is where the roots of capitalism actually come from. The idea of capitalism when it first started was I know how to do something. I have a service or a product. And if I build it and give it to you, you'll be better off. 
and I, in turn, will get paid and be better off too, rewarded altruism. What we do now is we manufacture need. I have something, I'm going to figure out how to convince you that you need it, and then, having convinced you that you need it, um, I'm going to sell it to you. We can't do that anymore. We don't have the resources to do it. So, what can we do? We can find markets of need. There are 1, billion pe 1 billion people on this planet with no access to drinking water. And because of that, 1.4 million children die every year of diarrhea. Now, this is, remember I asked you when we started that I want you to imagine that you're in charge? This is the part where I'm going to ask you to make a decision. We can now watch TV on our walkie-talkies, because that's what the cell phone is, right? It's a walkie-talkie. And we have made sure, we have so-called progressed to the stage where we can watch TV on the walkie-talkies. Now, here's the, you are all kings and queens, okay? Kings and queens of the universe, and you get to make a decision. In the next year, either we can get actual HD TV on the cell phone, we can improve the video quality on the cell phone, and not have access with drinking water, or we can improve access to drinking water and not have access to cell phones. So I'm going to ask you to raise your hands. All those of you who say, I want improved cell phones next year and not access to drinking water, please raise your hand. OK, that's good, because you might believe that markets actually will sort, sort out the cell phone problem. So you're brave. OK. All those of you who want improved access to drinking water, please raise your hands. Thank you, kings and queens. All those of you who, who really believe we'll actually get that improved access to drinking water next year instead of better cell phones, please raise your hands. Nobody's raising their hands. And this is the sad part of the story because what's happened is that we're no longer running this planet according to human values. And I just want to say with this to you in parting that you are the kings and the queens of the universe. Nothing on this planet happens without the joint agreement of all of humankind. And so many of us say when we go to work that we have to leave our personal values at home and make business decisions on behalf of the boss. And if we continue to do that, if we continue to leave our true human values at home, we are done. On the other hand, if we all act like kings and queens, then in 2011, fewer kids will die of thirst in 2010. In 2012, fewer kids will die of thirst than in 2011. In 2013, fewer kids will die of thirst than 2012. Year in, year out, fewer kids would die of thirst. And then one day, if you and I act like kings and queens, no children will die of thirst. And that, I believe, would be progress. So thank you.